feels good being in the house of the Lord. Right, what a wonderful time we had around here Sunday. Thank God for the wonderful miracles that took place. And God ministered in a special way. So good to be back in the house of the Lord again tonight. Amen. And all of our guests, let's give our guests a warm welcome. children are ready for super church they are waiting on you back there so that's a good time Praise God. Uh, brother these might be a little hot up here that might be reason you're getting a little feedback uh, brother Griffiths uh, called he's having his work late so the young people will get to sit in here with your pastor tonight. I know it's left yet. You know. So y'all can just stay in here. All right, something's still not right with this mic, and I'm not going to start till it gets sounding better. Can y'all hear me out there all right? Smile if you can hear me. Frown if you can't. get more smile. That's sounding better. Thank the Lord. All right. You're going to do that for me. I'm going to be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 13, and then we'll go to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse number 1. Let me remind all of the men of our men's fellowship service here in the sanctuary Friday night. Please be here at 7.30. Brother Rick Hall will be uh, speaking to us. And I'm sure he'll have some good things to say to us men. Uh, so this is your service. So be here. Have a good turnout. 7.30. <coughs> Come a little earlier for prayer would be good. We'll begin right at 7.30 for a good time Friday night. And then Sunday, um, for Sunday is Veteran Day weekend. And so in the second portion of our service Sunday, we will be taking time to uh, honor our veterans. And so it'll be a special time. You know, service Sunday evening, Department heads will be meeting for our annual planning. And so you'll be in prayer for all of us as we make plans for the coming year. And can you believe that we're only a couple of months away from another brand new year? You young folks, is this time, is it passing by? Quick. Yeah, you young folks feel that <laughs> Come on, help me out a little bit, you know. I, uh, something's kind of telling me that because I'm getting older, it's it's that way. But please don't tell me that's what it is. So you young folks, is time passing by faster now than it used to? Is it past? Okay, that makes me feel better. Uh, <laughs> it is the truth. It is passing by so, so quick. Thank the Lord. Good to see Brother and Sister Greenleaf here. Prayers have been with them, the loss of his mother, Sister Greenleaf's mother-in-law. We miss Sister Patty. Yes. Uh, but uh, we know she's in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And waiting for that day that we'll all meet together in the sky. Amen. Be with the Lord forever and forever. Uh, the book of Luke chapter 4 and verse number 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him, speaking of Jesus, for a season. Everybody say for a season. For a season. Then the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 1. And I'm sure that most of us could quote this scripture. So read it aloud with me now. To everything there is a season. 
and a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything there is a season. Now folks, we are in spiritual warfare in this hour. And I want to talk about that for a little while tonight. I won't be able to finish this lesson probably tonight, but then there's still more to come on, on spiritual warfare. And it's high time for all of us to wake up and realize that we are in a spiritual war and battle. And the more we become aware of that and understand the weapons that God has given us to fight in this spiritual war, the better off we are. Now, I'm not encouraging today for us to go around looking for devils under every bush, behind every bush, behind every tree. Uh, but some folks seem to be unaware that there's a devil out for your soul. Come on. And he's out for mine. And we are in spiritual war. Yeah. And so tonight I want to share some things with you. Brother Philip Harrison wrote some very good things concerning um, spiritual warfare about the six seasons of temptation. The six seasons. Of temptations right and all of us will go through these six seasons of temptation um, now maybe the last one some may not the last season that we'll talk about but uh, Lord Terrace is coming long enough most of us if not all of us will go through all of these six seasons of temptation and it's it's spiritual war, spiritual warfare. So let's pray and ask God to talk to our hearts tonight. Shall we, Lord, we're so thankful for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you for your wonderful presence that we've felt here tonight. Now, Lord, I pray that you will anoint me to minister your word. I pray that you will anoint the ears, the hearts of each and every one that's here tonight to hear and to receive your word and to respond to it in a very positive way tonight. We want to leave here motivated and strengthened and encouraged tonight and your word I know will do that if we'll open our hearts and receive it in Jesus' name. We'll praise you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And if you're going to help me teach tonight, clap your hands and lift your voice. seated. Sometimes a preacher is cast in the most or the unpopular role of preaching things that either people don't want to hear or things that they just don't want to believe. Um, there's nothing more disconcerting for a preacher to know that he has some real good advice not his own, but that of Scripture that would mightily help people to serve the Lord much more victoriously than what they're doing. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing more uh, scoffed at than the idea of a spiritual war that every man is involved in. Uh, most people just don't want to believe that they're in a skirmish or a battle or a war for their soul. But... Look at your neighbor and tell him you are in a war of, for your soul. All of us, I don't care who you are, every one of us are in a war for our soul. Uh, because we don't have spiritual eyes that can see into the world above, uh, it is difficult for our limited imagination to even consider the thought of a war taking place. Uh, we cannot see all of the things that are associated with war around us, you know, like tanks and 
armored personnel carriers and jets and guns and weapons. So there is a tendency to forget that we are in a battle for our souls. In fact, the devil longs to lull us to a state of sleepy spiritual lethargy and uh, we just fool about thinking that nothing is really taking place. We just go along happy-go-lucky and think, well, everything's okay. You need to understand the devil wants to lull us into that state of spiritual lethargy tonight. C.S. Lewis uh, said this. He said, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope the soft underfoot, without sudden turns, without milestones. Now, if, if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, how I many of you have the Holy Ghost here tonight? If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, whether you like it or not, you are in a fight for your life. And it, it, it's not my desire here tonight to cause you to have a, a fear of the enemy. Not the will of God for us to fear the enemy, be afraid of the enemy. But it's my desire to get you to understand that the devil works with great deception and temptation to cause you and me to fall. Right. And he's not going to give up until you take your last breath or until the rapture of the church takes place. He's after your soul. And, and again, I'm not... Uh, preaching tonight that we're to fear the enemy. The Bible tells us greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But I have a feeling that if our spiritual discernment has a great improvement after tonight, I believe that we suddenly are going to be more aware of what is going on around us. And that is why when we are Praying and spending time with the Word of God. Our minds and spirits have a higher sense to be able to see patterns and the way that the devil has taken advantage of us and taken advantage of our families and our friends and sometimes the church. And that's why the devil doesn't want you to pray. And he's going to hinder you in every way he can to keep you from spending time in prayer and spending time in the Word of God. United Pentecostal Church International missionaries uh, speak out of their thoughts concerning spiritual warfare. And, and uh, many of us uh, have heard or read uh, some of the things that our missionaries, our foreign missionaries have to say concerning spiritual warfare. Let me just mention some of the things. They say that demonic spirits have a tendency to be more openly confrontational in other countries because of the sway of influence they choose to well over the people to control them through fear. And of course, uh, you, you will find this uh, to fit well with Acts chapter 8 with Simon the sorcerer who controlled the people with his deception. And again, it would be important to note also in Acts chapter 16 with the slave girl who was a fortune, a fortune teller. But, but what is chilling is the fact that these missionaries tell that when they come home to the United States on furlough, after a four-year period of being out of the United States, they notice a deadened spiritual state among many churches. And they say very, their, their very little fervor and passion is noticed. They say what is passed as worship is usually man-centered entertainment almost devoid of the power of the Holy Ghost. What some of our missionaries are saying when they come back to the States. And, and that is what we're up against. And, and when asked why we don't see more confrontations with uh, demonic spirits here, this is what they say. They say that the spirits that confront the American churches are so subtle in their approach because they don't want to be ferreted out or exposed. And so they sit quietly on pews in churches and choose to influence through a sense 
of infiltration to destroy every bit of the godly and righteous influence that they can. That's chilling. But it's true. Working behind the scenes, they can generate sons of Siva who appear religious but are not righteous. Their lives are characteristically marked with little prayer, little devotion to God, and little hunger for the Word. No hunger for holiness, no desire for spiritual revival, and no desire for a national harvest of men. It's what our missionaries say when they come back after in other countries they see such and uh, have such confrontation with with evil spirits and demons over there but it seems here they sit by so subtle and try to influence the minds and the hearts of people and to do it in such a subtle way i'm convinced that there are people who sit here in this church who are entirely unconverted and are presently and presently are lost. But I'm also very convinced that there are some people in this church who are spiritual powerhouses that have a continued flow of the Spirit in their lives and are constantly seeking new ways to allow God's anointing to help them. I want to be one of those. How about you? And so I want nothing more than to take the Word of God and to help you to see that there is much at stake in your spiritual life. There is much at stake here tonight. And the uh, fact of the matter is that you will make it if you endure to the end. It is not without a fight. But I'm going to tell you it's going to be worth the fight. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And now there's laid up for me a crown over. It's going to be worth the fight to make it all the way to the end. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. People that are prayed up. People who are studied up. I mean, they study the Word of God. And they are prayer for people. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. Luke 22 and 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Let's all understand here tonight that Satan desires to have every one of us he desires every young person that's under the sound of my voice. He desires every middle-aged person, every elder in this church. Satan desires to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Folks, we can't win through our own might and our own power. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm glad we've got something in us that has guaranteed that if we'll let it work for us, we'll be victorious over anything that comes against us in this end time. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Amen. Paul is letting us know you've got everything you need to stand. Amen. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to run, take the tough hit, and, and run and, 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 and get in a corner somewhere and, and be a coward. No, he said you've got everything you need to be victorious over the spirits of hell in this end time. And you can stand in that evil time and day. You 
can stand. You can make it. And so it is a fact that we're all in a battle. We're all in a war. We are fighting for our soul. It's, it's as the song says, this is, this is not a playground, brother. It's a battlefield. That's right. It's a battlefield. And so we're all at war. And so let's, let's look at these six seasons of temptation that, that we're all going to face in our walk with God. Of course, as we read our text tonight from Luke and Ecclesiastes, there is a clear understanding as to the fact that there are certain seasons that take place in our lives. All of us face these seasons in our life. And of course, if the devil left the Lord for a season, that means that his three temptations took place also in a season, which is pretty elementary, I know. But William Gurnall had this to say. He said, Satan knows when to make his approaches, when, if at any time, he is most likely to be entertained. As Christ hath the tongue of the learned to speak, uh, a word in season of counsel and comfort to a doubting dropping soul. So Satan shows his black art and hellish skill in speaking words of seduction and temptation in season. And a word in season is a word on its wheels. And so there are probably many more times that we find ourselves in a season of temptation in our spiritual war. But, but I'm going to just use six here tonight, and again, we probably won't be able to cover all six of them, and I know that it is not exhausted by any means, but you can probably add to these just by reading through the Bible and reading people who found themselves under the attack of Satan and probably come up with some more seasons, but let's talk about six of them. Uh, the first season comes immediately after conversion. Immediately after conversion. Of course, the devil does his best to attack a new saint in the early stages of his or her new life uh, because he hates what has taken place with the work of righteousness. It becomes his intent to destroy the new faith of the new convert. And so, if you're a new convert here tonight, you haven't been in the church very long, you're a new convert, and of course all of us need to be aware of this again tonight because we have a responsibility to help the new converts. Okay. But uh, new converts need to understand that, uh, the, that Satan is upset and mad because uh, there's been a change wrought in your life and you're no longer sitting at his table. You put your feet under the table of the Lord and you're walking a new path and you're living for God and the chains have been wrought in your life and the devil hates that. And so he, he comes after conversion. Of course, the attack may not come the week after or maybe not even a month after because the excitement and the desire is, is high. You know, it's at a high pitch. There, there's new wonder in their soul for worship and for the Word of God and for prayer and for evangelism. That just You remember how it was when you were converted? Yes, amen. Amen. Some of you do. Yes. Oh, come on, it's been 50-something years for me and I can remember it as it was yesterday. Yes. Most of you had had it that long. You ought to remember that time when you were converted. Oh, you just couldn't get enough church. You couldn't get enough worship. You just you wanted to pray, talk to God. You want to be involved in telling people about what happened in your life. If you've lost all of that, we just probably need a good renewing of the Holy Ghost and get all that excitement back. Can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. But, uh, you know, in the beginning of that conversion, and all of this is going on, the devil kind of shies away from them during this period of time. But when the initial inspiration of salvation begins to taper, he, he attacks. He attacks through ridicule from their closest friends and family members. Amen. 
through intense temptation from the old crowd to do the old things again. Through reminding them of their failures of the past. Or through distractions of all kinds. Entertainment, shopping, hobbying. So that there's no time to care for their soul. Let me just say to us all today that your soul is always going to be cultivated in the quiet places of devotion. I'm talking about private prayer, private Bible reading, private meditation. Don't ever get away from that. Every person here today, every new convert, every babe in Christ, don't ever get away from that time of just getting away with God in your private prayer time and private devotion and Bible reading and private meditation and, and some who have strayed away from that, you would be doing yourself a good favor if you get back to that again and understand that's where your strength comes from. That's where your joy is going to come from. That's where the excitement of living for God is going to come from the time you spend with God in prayer and Bible study and meditating upon the things of God. So making them to think that they can have the best of both worlds, you know, the church and the world. These are the ways Satan attacks the new convert. And of course, this pattern is an old one. It's to attack the young devil is that way. He, he wants to attack the young. Just as Pharaoh in Egypt wanted to destroy all of the new babies born in Goshen, the devil does the same thing. Just as Herod tried to destroy Jesus by killing all of the young males in Jerusalem, the devil wants to kill all the newly converted. Amen. He's out to get them. And of course the remedy for their Escape is for someone to build an ark to save them. I, I want all of us who have been in the church for a while to hear me tonight. Amen. Nothing is more crucial for Jochebed and Miriam to rise up to their responsibilities toward these new converts to help them fend off the attacks of the hardened heart of the devil. I'm going to tell you, the devil has no heart. I don't care how young they are. He's out to get up. His desire is to bring them back into bitter bondage and the hard labor of the sinful life. What are you saying, Brother Hodge? I'm saying that I want to encourage every hearty saint of God to get these new converts, those that are here and those who will be coming into this church and get them under your wings and help them to make it to the celestial city. We've got a responsibility to help the baby yes. and the young in the Lord. It's our responsibility. We can't just leave them on their own and say, well, make it the best way you can. No, as they come into the church and born again in the water and the spirit, we need to be there encouraging them, helping them, because we understand that this is the season that Satan will attack them after their conversion. That's the first season. And so if the first season of temptation takes place immediately after conversion, the second season of temptation takes place when the pain of life settles in on us. You see, the devil is, a, is masterful in attacking us with painful situations, both of the mind and the body. Sick bodies and sick minds become Satan's playground. And in those times of gripping pain, he makes us to think that God has forgotten us and that God does not care about us and God doesn't really love us or we wouldn't be having the pain that we're having. He longs for us to think that the Spirit and the church has led us into some blind alley of desertion. Uh, he is like a an attacker who goes in to take a wall city and he looks for the weaknesses that are in the wall. Uh, Job, in his great loss of health, 
wealth and family. When the devil attacked with a vengeance for him to curse God and die. Why don't you curse God and die? It was during that time of losing so much and the pain that Job was feeling. That's when the devil poured the heat on. Why don't you just curse God? Curse God. Jesus fasted for 40 days. It was then that the devil attacked with a fierceness of temptation. And so when we are hurting, temptation is never stronger as when we are at our weakest point. And that's why it's so important that we love and care for one another. And when we see a brother or a sister hurting and they're going through things in life and situations are happening, we don't need to turn our back on them. We need to be there. I'm not talking about being busy bodies and nosy and trying to find out everything that's going. No, I'm just talking about being a friend, being there, being a support, and letting them know I'm here to pray with you and I'm here for you because the devil, he attacks with all of his spirit. When pain comes and things are happening in our lives. Amen. And of course, during this time, the devil will paint up sin as a, as a certain way for us to escape through the very sin that will damn us. And, you know, that's the sly way and that's the sly approach that the devil has to the saints when, when the saint of God is down. How many have been tempted to, to go out and do things, maybe what they used to do when they were down and not realizing that that's the enemy tempting them to go back into where God had brought them from, not understanding and realizing that that sin will damn their soul. It will not help them. Revelations two and ten: Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. Somebody shout faithful Faith. unto death. Yeah. And what's going to happen? He said, I will give thee a crown of life. Again, it's going to be worth the fight. Amen. Whatever you have to do to win, overcome, it's going to be worth it to receive a crown of life. Uh, suffering is it, just really a fact of our life as long as we're on this earth. In a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. And so in this life you're going to have problems and troubles and tribulations. Of course what the devil blurs our mind to, he makes us think that once you receive the Holy Ghost that you will be immune from all suffering. But consider what God told Ananias to tell Saul in Acts 9, 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him, notice this, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> well, that sounded encouraging, didn't it? Yeah. And I go tell Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, you go tell him that I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Mm. Notice what God says. Show him the great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He did not say, tell him what great revivals that will take place in his ministry. <laughs> Even though he had them. He, he didn't say, tell him what great missionary efforts he will be involved in. He said, tell him, or he didn't tell him, uh, to go tell him that he will write over half of the New Testament. That's not what God told Ananias to tell Paul or Saul at that time. You know, he didn't say, tell him that he will have a great impact on the church until the return of the Lord. You say it, Brother Hyde. I'm saying, you find any man or woman who has been greatly used of God, and I will show you a person who has had their share of suffering and attacks from hell. You want to be used of God? 
Oh, I want to be used of God like so and so. Well, better be careful what you're asking for. But I'm going to tell you right now, anybody, man or woman, that's been greatly used of, uh, by God have had to deal with Satan and situations and struggles and attacks from the very pits of hell. But I'm going to tell you, being used of God is worth it. I said it's worth it. And the rewards are going to be great for those who work for the Lord and serve Him. So, what are you saying? I'm saying don't take suffering personal. It will happen to everyone who walks this path toward heaven. All of us are going to suffer because there is a devil. We're in a spiritual war. And so, because you've lived for God and, and things start happening that you don't understand why I'm serving God, why is this happening to me, don't take it so personal. Understand that all of us, if you're going to live for God anytime and do anything for the Lord, there's going to be some suffering. Right. Amen. You say, well, that sounds really encouraging, Brother Hodge. Well, let me just go on to tell you, you're going to make it. Amen. I said you're going to make it. Yeah. And it's going to be worth it all when you make it. Yeah. This is not a negative message here tonight. It's just to inform us and get us to wake up to the fact that we're at spirit in a spiritual war here tonight. And we can't let our guards down. We've got to understand the devil hates us. Yes. And he's out to destroy our soul. And he'll try to use these times when you're suffering and, and you're hurting and you're going through things in life that you really don't understand why. The devil will attack you. He'll attack your mind. He'll try to get you to doubt the love of God. Try to get you to doubt the word of God. And even question God. So you understand this attack is coming from the enemy. Amen. You know, the devil is an expert in taking advantage of the deceptive humanistic thinking that is prevalent in our world today. He's an expert at taking advantage of that. But notice 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Understand, our battle tonight is not with flesh. Our battle is with spirits. Our battle is with the devil, the enemy of our soul. We're not to be fighting against one another. Right. We're to be loving and helping one another and caring for one another. The devil is our enemy. And so he says that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, everybody say bringing into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's some powerful weapons. So he's telling us, you get ready, there are going to be seasons that, that you're going to face temptation. It's going to come when you've been converted, shortly after you've been converted, these attacks are going to come. And they'll come from every end. And then you're, you're going to be attacked in the second season whenever, whenever pain of life settles in. You have to start facing things and going through things in your life. The devil is going to come against you and against your mind to make you think God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. But if the devil can get our minds thinking opposite of what the Word of God has to say, much of his battle is over. Did you hear me? Did you grab hold of that? If the devil can get our minds thinking opposite of what God word, God's Word has said, then his battle is about over. 
What a twisted thing he has done to the modern church in the area of our thinking about suffering. Just remember this. The times of greatest spiritual fellowship often comes when we are in our greatest point of pain. The greatest time, the greatest spiritual fellowship often comes when we are in our greatest point of pain. In those times when struggles come, the pain comes, situations arise. It's then when we understand where our help comes from. And we look in the right places and we realize, I've got to take this to God. I've got to spend some time with the Lord. And many times it's in those points of pain, things that we're going through, that we have the greatest time of fellowship with God and God's able to deal with us. Any time that everything is going good, we think, wow, I can coast along now. You know, everything's going well. It, it's amazing what a day can bring. It's really amazing what just an hour can bring. People can be smiling one moment and laughing, and then before the hour's over, they can be weeping and crying. That's life. During these times when pain comes and we realize I need God. I, I, of course, I don't want to I, I don't wait until these times come. I want to be, be like Daniel. The Bible said he prayed three times a day, even knowing that he could be cast to the lions for praying to God. It didn't stop Daniel. Daniel. In fact, he just opened the windows. He could care less who hurt him. And he prayed three times a day when things were going well for Daniel. Everything was all right. But then all of a sudden, he's grabbed and taken before the king. Here's a man that's gone against your decree. And, and he's praying to another god. And you know what your decree says? He's to be thrown to the lion's den. Of course, the king hated that. He loved that. But he had to do it. The next morning, the king says, Oh, Daniel! Was your God able to save you? Daniel said, Oh, fear not, oh king. I'm here. Everything's all right. And you knew if I'll serve God, if I'll pray, if I'll stay close to God while everything is going good, everything going my way, I mean, everything's lovely. If I'll be faithful to God, then I don't have to worry when pain comes. I don't have to worry when the storms come into my life. I know that He's going to be there. He's going to be there. And He knows my voice. God. And so, in the, if the first season of temptation takes place immediately after conversion, the second season of temptation takes place when the pain of life settles in on us. And I'm not going to be able to go to the other four. Be back next Wednesday for the continuation. And we'll talk next week about the third season of temptation takes place when be here Winston you'll find out <laughs> let's stand and love the Lord right now shall we I want us to just reach out and we've got time we're still a little early but just not time for me to finish so this is a good stopping place but I want us to understand that there is a war raging and the devil hates us He's going to do everything within his power to destroy your soul. And the devil hates this apostolic church. Yes. You hear me. The devil hates this apostolic church. Yes. Down through the years, he's attacked. He's come against this apostolic church. And there have been those who have given in to those temptations. There are those who have given in to compromise. There are those who have given in to worldliness. And I'm telling you, there are churches today that... You'd have never dreamed, seeing them today, you'd have never dreamed they used to be 
what they once were. But it's because they gave in to the temptation of the seasons. And understand that the devil would love nothing better than for the First United Pentecostal Church of Savannah, Georgia to go the way of the world. But we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. No, when, when the heat is poured on, we're just going to pray more. We're going to study more. We're going to preach more. We're going to teach more. We're not going to give in. Thank God. This is the one God has to stop. Come and talk to the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, heal. Jesus, name, pray. Very fire for God, the holiness of loving, a separated people. That's what God is coming back for. And that's what I want to be when He comes back for His church. You understand, we're in a battle. We're not careful. We'll let Satan come in among us and influence in such a sly way. That's why we must have the gift of discerning of spirits in operation in our church. Because there are many spirits that come in among us and they're not here to help. They're here to destroy. They're here to tear down. They're here to hinder. But God's going to help us. You hear me? God's going to help us. God's going to help us. That's why you need to pray for your leaders. You need to pray for your pastor every day. God, give our pastor that spirit of discernment. God, give our pastor that holy moment. Give our pastor that courage. God, give our pastor that conviction. Amen, 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 amen. And not just for me, but all the leadership of this local assembly. He had much prayer because the enemy would love nothing better to get us all to let down and compromise and, and give up and give in to the spirit of this world. No, God's coming back for a glorious church and that's what we're going to be by the help of the Lord. Amen. As we work together, as we work together, they understand we're not fighting against one another. We're fighting against the devil. We're fighting against principalities and power. And the Bible said you've got every weapon that you need to be victorious. So take hold of it. Put on the whole armor of God. And let's fight the battle. And we're going to win in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're going to win in Jesus' name. Yeah. This is right now. Brother, find your brother. Let your hands over your brother's shoulder. Sister, find your sister. Lay your hands on their shoulder. And let's pray for that God will help us and, and let's be there for one another to make it near these seasons of temptation.
want to pray for our sister Jelena Roberts. Uh, prayer need. Let's believe the Lord to touch Jelena tonight. Also, Sister Francia Fernandez, let's continue to pray for her for a speedy recovery. We believe in the Lord. And we're ready to see her back in church. Man, I know she's ready to get back here. Praise God. If you have a need, you want us to hear me pray about, send your hand up. God knows what they are. Jesus, in your wonderful name, Lord, we pray that you will touch Jelena right now. In the name of Jesus, manifest your power and your glory. Minister, I pray in Jesus' name. Oh, yes, you're the need supplier. You're the Lord of the Lord. You're the way maker. I need you right now. You're the spirit. And you're the work that needs to be done. Sister Francia right now. Let her feel the mind touch. Of your healing virtue and power in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. To your glory and for your name's sake, we believe you. Every hand that's been lifted representing needs in the house, minister to every need, in every situation. Let your will be done and we praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everybody shout, Amen. Thank the Lord. Please remember all of the announcements, things that are going on uh, the rest of this week. Uh, tomorrow is Joshua Greenleaf's birthday. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And then Sister Ruby, Sister Ruby's not here. I think her birthday is also tomorrow. Sister Ruby. Uh, Oh, let's let's hear everybody turn to Joshua and sing happy birthday to him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.